We are looking at G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, issue number 15, published by Marvel Comics. On the front cover, we see Quinn, Dr. Venom, and Snake Eyes. They're in an airplane. It looks like a bomber, and the bomb bay doors are open. Snake Eyes is hanging out of the plane by his fingers, and Dr. Venom is stomping on him. This cover is okay. I would like it better if it had more action in it, but we do wonder how this trio got in this predicament. On the splash page, we have a title, Red Eye to Miami, with a creative team of Larry Hama script, Mike Vosberg pencils, and John D'Agostino inks. The splash page features an image of Dr. Venom begging for his life as Cobra soldiers disguised as mercenaries hold him and Snake Eyes at gunpoint. Now hold the phone. We start this issue with Snake Eyes and Venom still at the river with the sunken bunker, but when we ended the last issue, the uh, Cobra soldiers already had Snake Eyes and Dr. Venom tied up and were marching them through the jungle. Somehow we have backtracked and eliminated part of the story from last issue. The bald Cobra soldier wants to just eliminate Dr. Venom, but the leader says that Cobra Commander is going to want proof that these guys are dead, and if they kill them now, they'd have to haul their bodies all the way through the jungle to the airfield. But if they keep them alive, Venom and Snake Eyes can be forced to march to the airfield. Venom says he is a pilot and when they get to the airfield, he can fly them out of the country. The Cobra squad leader asks where Quinn is, and Venom says Quinn is dead. He accidentally hit his head on the doorframe of the bunker when they were escaping. Of course, that's a lie. Venom actually hit Quinn in the head with a wrench. But Quinn is not quite dead. He slowly emerges from the water and shoots all the Cobra soldiers with his 30 caliber Browning. Dr. Venom is naturally surprised by this. Snake Eyes shoves him out of the way, but Snake Eyes is not trying to save Dr. Venom's life. Snake Eyes shoves Dr. Venom's head under the water and tries to drown him. Quinn insists that Snake Eyes let Dr. Venom up. They need him to fly them out of the country once they get to the airfield. Back at the airfield, Snake Eyes, Quinn, and Venom look over the aircraft they may hijack. They observe a British Lancaster bomber and some Spitfires. These are World War II aircraft and already and antiques by the 1980s. These are not aircraft you would expect to see in a modern air force, but in this fictional South American country of Sierra Gordo, that must be all they could afford. The Lancaster bomber is the only one of the aircraft that has the range to get them back to the States. And we're starting to see how Snake Eyes, Quinn, and Venom ended up in the bomber as we see them on the front cover. Snake Eyes and Quinn quietly take out the guards. The three men board the bomber. Venom is in the pilot seat Snake Eyes mans the machine guns, and Quinn sits in the engineer's seat. Quinn studies the flight manual, and Dr. Venom suggests that since Quinn has flown small aircraft, he might give Dr. Venom a break at the controls, but Quinn says he won't do that if it involves him turning his back on Dr. Venom, and that's the right thing, because you don't ever want to turn your back on Dr. Venom. That's when he shoves the knife between your shoulder blades. Dr. Venom starts the engines on the bomber, but only three of the four engines start, and they need all four engines to get off the ground. The revving engines alert the guards, and they open fire on the airplane. Dr. Venom gets the plane rolling down the runway. With only three engines running, they can't get up enough speed to take off, so Dr. Venom pulls a U-turn and heads toward the other end of the runway. As he does so, Snake Eyes uses the machine gun to take out the fighter aircraft so they won't have any fighter planes that will follow them. With all the fighter planes taken out, Snake Eyes turns his machine gun to the control tower and returns fire at the guards. They're running out of time, though, as they're being chased by trucks with machine guns, and there's a barricade at the other end of the runway. Snake Eyes opens fire on their pursuers, and at the last possible moment, Dr. Venom gets the fourth engine started. The plane takes off, and it barely makes it over the trucks that are blocking the runway, and the landing gear are taken out. They are in the the air, and after all the excitement, Dr. Venom asks Quinn to take over the controls. Uh, Dr. Venom will study the flight manual while Quinn flies toward Florida. But of course, Dr. Venom is going to double-cross his companion. He's not just studying the flight manual, he is tapping out a message in Morse code to Cobra. Unfortunately for the Titanic trio, they did not take out all the fighter planes. One remained, and it is pursuing them now. Snake Eyes shoots at the fighter plane and 
and Dr. Venom tries to outmaneuver it, but the bomber is just too sluggish uh, to get away from the much more maneuverable fighter plane, and so the fighter moves in for the kill. Dr. Venom points the nose of the bomber directly at the ground. The fighter plane follows, and then suddenly Venom throws on all of the running lights on the bomber, which blinds the fighter pilot. The bomber pulls up at the last second, and the blinded fighter pilot flies directly into the ground and crashes. Quinn says to Dr. Venom, you are a good pilot, Venom. Too bad the weasel spirit lives in your belly like a cancer. Throughout their story, Quinn equates Dr. Venom with the spirit of the weasel, and Quinn has the spirit of the bear. So this conflict between Dr. Venom and Quinn is also a metaphysical conflict between the attributes of those spirit animals. We get a brief break from our main story as we go to Cobra headquarters, where they have received the message from Dr. Venom. They now know that Dr. Venom is alive, and he has a serum that will stabilize the deadly plague toxin. In the last issue, the plague toxin, which was supposed to be harmless to its carrier, did not work because Dr. Venom had withheld a key ingredient. Cobra Commander would still like to know how Destro knew that G.I. Joe was going to attack the Cobra secret base in the furniture factory in Vermont in the last issue. Destro just kind of blames that on Scarface. We, the readers, know that Destro was the one that tipped G.I. Joe off to that operation. But Destro then had to go and rescue Cobra Commander because he had unintentionally put the Baroness in danger. Meanwhile, in the bomber, somewhere over the Gulf of Mexico, headed toward Florida, Dr. Venom tells Snake Eyes that the bomb bay doors are slipping and asks him to lash them closed. As Snake Eyes is stepping over the doors, Dr. Venom drops him out. Of course he does. Dr. Venom is always trying to harm other people for his own advantage and always trying to work some kind of double cross. Quinn comes to Snake Eyes' rescue, but Dr. Venom tilts the plane up, causing Quinn to slip over the side. Quinn grabs the edge, and just as he is about to grab Snake Eyes, the rope that Snake Eyes is holding on to snaps. Snake Eyes grabs Quinn's ankle, and as Quinn tries to haul them both back up into the plane, Dr. Venom beats Quinn in the head with a wrench. The wrench seems to be Dr. Venom's weapon of choice. Quinn calls on Strength of the Bear. Strength of the Bear. The Bear. The Bear. The bear. The bear. He gets back on the plane, grabs Dr. Venom, and he's about to throw him off when Snake Eyes stops him. Quinn utters the line that we will hear again in the future. A man who whips a dog will pull his own sled someday. Dr. Venom has tried to kill both Quinn and Snake Eyes on multiple occasions, and as long as he is still alive, Quinn and Snake Eyes will have to watch their backs. We get another brief break from our main story as we go to G.I. Joe headquarters, where the Joes are discussing the operation in Vermont from the last issue. The fire at Cobra's Vermont base destroyed most of the evidence, but they did discover that Cobra's plot has something to do with printer's ink. And then at Cobra headquarters, Cobra Commander meets with Major Blood, and Major Blood flashes Cobra Commander a Nazi salute. I'm kind of glad they got away from these Nazi salutes in later issues. Cobra Commander tells Major Blood that he has a problem, and that problem is Destro. Elsewhere in Cobra headquarters, Destro is revealing his betrayal of Cobra Commander to the Baroness. The Baroness's loyalty is now split. She will not betray Cobra Commander, but she will also will not betray Destro. Back over the Gulf of Mexico, the bomber is flying low over the water, and it spots what appears to be a fishing boat, but it is actually a smuggling boat, and the boat opens fire on the plane. The plane doesn't have any way to return fire, and the fire from the boat ruptures a fuel tank on the aircraft, and the fuel sprays from the aircraft all over the boat, and the muzzle flashes from the machine gun ignite the fuel, and the boat explodes. Now the plane is leaking fuel, and they may not make it to the Florida coast. They start throwing out everything that isn't nailed down, including chopping off the bomb bay doors. Based on the illustration, it looked like they threw out Quinn's machine gun, but on closer inspection, that looks like a different machine gun. Dr. Venom has asked Cobra Commander to have a 
lawyer meet him in Miami. To lighten the weight of the aircraft, they even start knocking away the side panels. At the Miami airport, the Cobra lawyer that Dr. Venom requested has arrived. At Miami Beach, people are playing and splashing around in the water and having some fun in the sun until they see a bomber headed straight for them and they start to run. Almost everybody runs, but one elderly couple lounging in beach chairs just sits there and watches the bomber come toward them. The old man recognizes the bomber as a Lancaster, and that brings his memory back to his World War II service days. As the bomber is skipping across the water and crashing toward the beach, the old couple uh, calmly have a conversation about the old days. This scene may seem kind of odd, but I find it very endearing. It makes me want to get to know these people better. And hearing this old veteran talk, you could just imagine that someday in the far future, Duke and Mrs. Duke could be sitting on a beach having a conversation very much like this one. So the bomber comes to a stop on the beach and the poor old lady gets sand in her drink. The plane is immediately surrounded by Miami police. The police immediately arrest the trio, but when they get back to the police station, the Cobra lawyer produces a writ of habeas corpus for the release of Dr. Venom. Uh, the other two, however, have to go to the jail cell and Dr. Venom celebrates with a cigar. And that was the end of Red Eye to Miami. This issue is pretty good, though not necessarily my favorite. The story focused primarily on Quinn, Snake Eyes, and Dr. Venom. We got a little bit of development from the main G.I. Joe team and Cobra, but right now the comic book is deeply into the Quinn and Dr. Venom story arc. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It was one of the most important story arcs of the early comic book series. I do recommend this issue primarily because it is important to that Quinn and Dr. Venom story arc, uh, which will lead to one of the most dramatic scenes in the entire comic book series. That was a review of G.I. Joe issue number 15. I hope to join you with issue number 16 soon. Please don't forget to check me out on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and and support the channel on Patreon if you can. Also, I have added a coffee account, so if you'd like to support the channel by leaving a tip, that would certainly help me continue to give you these videos. Thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you soon, and remember, until then, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.